Joined by Paul Gigot, editorial page editor of the Wall Street Journal, Steve Ratner, former counselor to the Treasury Department, ABC's Cokie Roberts, and John Carl from the White House and Soldad uh, O'Brien, the CEO of Starfish Media Group, formerly of CNN. Thanks for joining us this morning. And Paul, I, I got to tell you, I, I'm a little bit surprised by what, what I heard this morning. I was expecting about six days in, a little more give, maybe just a little more give from either side, nothing. Well, I think the speaker is being honest when he says he doesn't want to default. I don't think he wanted to shut down either. He got a shutdown. We got a shutdown. Why? Because he's caught between the president's refusal to negotiate at all and his part of his party base, which looks at that and says, well, why should we then negotiate? So he is caught in the middle. And I think what you saw there was a negotiating position, but a firm one. And I think that the president... It's, it's a negotiating position now six days in and closing in fast. On I the agree. He, there, the, he's playing with fire, but so is the president. Right. I mean, as you said, the president ha the presidents in the past have negotiated. There have been 53 debt limit increases since 1978, uh, uh, and 27 of those were not clean. They were not just raise the debt limit. They included reforms, often important budget reforms. That's what the speaker wants. If the president refuses to negotiate, he may think, boy, this is great. The Republicans are going to get the blame. But if we go over that edge, he will too. McCokie, the president's not moving. It, at least at the moment, he's not. At the moment, neither side is moving, and that's where we are. And and the American people think that they're a bunch of kids playing in a sandbox, and and neither side is covering itself with glory. I must say, this whole business of you know we won't negotiate with a gun to your head. Actually, I'd prefer to negotiate with a gun to my head rather than have somebody shoot me. And I think that that's where they they could end up uh, if they don't s sit down and talk. And so both sides really do need to do so. Now, I've got to believe that there is something in back pockets, even if there's nobody in a back room, well, there's something in a back pocket. I want to bring everybody in on that, but John Carl, let me, let me, I, you know, you're, you're at the White House every single day from the reporting I've done on both sides. I don't think there is a back pocket here. No, no, there isn't. And look, the White House view on this is that they can get complete and total victory on this, that the Republicans uh, have frankly misbehaved, they have mishandled the politics. Look, what, what is the great Republican accomplishment so far? They've managed to pay 800,000 federal workers for not working. The White House believes that they can have basically demand unconditional surrender on the part of the Republicans and politically they will win. The danger here, George, though, is that at the end of the day, if the consequences are as great as the White House says, if this right. really could put us into a recession as bad as 2008, then at the end of the day, Republicans may take the political blame in the short term, but it's the president's economy. Let me get Steve Radner on this. Yeah. Steve, you've worked inside this administration. The Treasury Department also spent many years uh, on Wall Street. One of the things that's also surprised me is that Wall Street, at least not yet, just doesn't believe we're going to default. Correct. Wall Street doesn't believe we're going to default. Wall Street doesn't believe shutdowns are that consequential economically, and so Wall Street has been relatively sanguine about it. But as you heard Senator Schumer say, if you go back to 2011, when we almost did default, ultimately got downgraded by S&P, uh, the stock market did drop by 16 percent over a very short per period of time. There are demonstrable examples of where business confidence, consumer spending, things like that uh, were affected. Let me just say two things. First, one, one of the things I found interesting about the Boehner interview was, in the middle of it somewhere, he stopped talking about Obamacare and start, started talking about debts and deficit. And so he seems to be pivoting and saying, we want to have a conversation now about debts without and deficit. Without moving off and, the Obamacare and, position. And, and right. Entitled. Well, without moving off it yet. But, but, and then you heard Senator Schumer make the point I would have made, which is you can't negotiate when somebody is kidnapping your children. In other words, Obama was not going to negotiate about Obamacare. Talking about debts and deficit is a conversation you can have. But you have 11 days. You're not going to have a serious conversation in 11 days. But you can agree to have a conversation about it. Meanwhile, Soldat O'Brien, the country just getting completely oh, fed up. Oh, it's ridiculous. Absolutely. I mean, you saw those little clips of people all really frustrated because nobody's talking. But I do think it comes to who's going to get the blame finally. And, and if, in fact, you go into catastrophe, right, everybody gets the blame. And maybe that's what will propel everybody to start working together. But it was interesting to hear Boehner say, you know, that, in fact, and you pushed him hard on this, you know, that it was really his decision. The whole idea was not Ted Cruz decision. This was his decision back about a lot of evidence Obama. countering that. There's a, a t about a ton of evidence countering that. So I thought that was really interesting that he's I mean, saying this is my decision here. And and you're right, a pivot. But I tell you, I mean, I the, the other big news in your interview is he confirmed that he had a deal with Harry Reid to have this temporary funding bill. Colleen, I mean, that was their intention. That was the Republican leadership's contention. They now, George, the Republicans own this shutdown. You have never seen a situation where you have a short term stopgap uh, spending bill that just is supposed to give more time for them to do their job and then demand major policy. If we get a default, it'll be a merger. Uh, it'll be a merger. Believe me, there is a way out here, uh, George. And you heard that, I think. 
think the the speakers say he mentioned Paul Ryan and Patty Murray the budget right. direct budget right. uh, chairman in the house and the senate they have been talking behind the scenes and they have been saying basically that not a lot of negotiations but there is a path there of regular order if the president would agree to say look I will talk to you about entitlements in return for the getting rid of the spending sequester on discretionary spending which the Democrats hate because it's pushing down spending on education and what women and you say and children, it's a way out I'll bring this to Steve Ratner what the White House says is there no way that they're going to get into a real conversation that includes entitlements unless new revenues are on the table and you heard the speaker right there that's not going to be right. part of the conversation you, you took the words out of my mouth. George. That's exactly what I was going to say. That there has, to, if you're going to have a package, it has to be a package. It has to include everything. And by the way, on this issue of who's not negotiating with whom, let's remember the House passed a budget in the spring, the Senate passed a budget in the spring. The Republicans have refused to allow that to go to conference and have this negotiation, which we could have had starting last spring, and perhaps not been in the position we're in today. But, you know, the, when it gets to this question of who's winning, which, of course, is part of what's driving the American people crazy, um, the Republicans who are objecting in the House are doing just fine in terms of their own districts. Well, and, the demographics, and right, of their they've, districts they've got don't their, match their, the and, and, you know, they won elections, too. And, uh, and they won elections by bigger margins than the president did. So as far as they're concerned, they're doing what their voters want. And now they're putting all these things on the floor where the Democrats are having to vote against veterans' benefits and all of that. So they feel like they're also making great ads for the fall campaign in the very few districts where there are uh, competitive races. So, you know, from their perspective, it's not so terrible. But many of them are also saying that they feel okay about not raising the debt ceiling, right? So you're going to have a problem. I mean, who's that uh, Congressman Yoho, I think, from Florida, Florida, who said something like it would bring stability to the marketplace. In fact, <laughs> if we defaulted on our debt, which is kind of insane. But so clearly the Republican leadership does not agree with that. And that's what I want to bring back to Paul Jago. You heard uh, Senator Schumer say that uh, when big business really kicks in, uh, that's going to force the Republicans to move. I, 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 I share I, your skepticism. Well, I don't <laughs> think big business really counts all that much for those folks. Right. I think what counts for, much, for, for something is what the marginal seat Republicans will say and what could happen to them if the Republicans get a blame for get the blame for an economic uh, uh, problem. They're the ones who could cost the House, their, the Republicans, their major, majority in the House. And that's where I think the, the, some of these people, it's Peter King, but it's also people in Wisconsin, Sean Duffy and Rhinelander. Uh, those those are swing seats. They will pay the price if Republicans lose this showdown in the public opinion. And Carl, let, me, let me press you on, on what might be a way out. Paul Chigo offered one possibility. You've raised the prospect of a, a kind of Cuban Missile Crisis style solution, and I tried to get it to, to, to Speaker Boehner a little bit, where both sides figure out a way to move off their positions, even when they're not admitting to it. Yeah, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, of course, you know, the, the firm position of JFK is we unconditionally those missiles must leave Cuba and they did leave and six months later some US missiles moved out of Turkey <laughs> right. so so you need something they look the Republicans at this point have gotten themselves into this dark alley into this box canyon they need a way out they cannot unconditionally surrender I mean the White House I think that the danger for the White House is they are so convinced that they have the upper hand and they do right now absolutely have the upper hand that they will overplay that and force the well, Republicans into the a self-destructive move. What is the point of that? What is the point of the White House well, the, pushing the, them so hard well, the that point they have is to that, cry uncle? Is, is they believe that this whole brinksmanship, that you know, the whole notion of threatening default, uh, has changed the balance of power, and it makes it so you know if, if one party in Congress, if one group in Congress can can force the president to make big concessions because they're threatening to blow up the economy you've now uh, shifted the balance the but the White House it, it, so they, they almost think that it is worth going into default well the, to break their this position well, is I, that it is worth going into default yeah. I, I'm not sure the White House thinks it's worth going to default. the White House position is the Republicans have asked for A B C D E all the way down to Z is what they want from the XL pipeline to to some issues around abortion obviously deficit, all the stuff and the White House is saying well what's in it for us all we want to do is keep the government running and if you want to have a bigger deal fine you put some stuff on the table we'll put some stuff on the table but not sort of unilaterally sort of give the Republicans a bunch of stuff simply to avoid default and I think you see here that in what Speaker Boehner said where he both said you know listen we decided we had to stand our ground 
and then at the same time say, but Harry Reid really is the one who's not moving. You, you can't argue both of those <laughs> things simultaneously. It's completely contrary. George, I think there's another part of the calculation here from the White House's point of view, and that's the 2014 elections. When I was here last time, right. I said, I think uh, the president may want a shutdown. Right. Because his agenda is going He's got the shutdown. He cannot right. want but, default. But he, he, he doesn't want, want default, but I think he does want to go right up to the edge of default because I think he needs something to change. I think he feels my agenda is so, going nowhere. I'm down in the polls. I've got to do something. What so, can I do? I can take back the House. In and, 20 and, 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 and then go out in a liberal place. So you're more. saying that the president went to Ted Cruz and said, I want you to get this House Republican. <laughs> but that, that put this ridiculous no. demand on the table so we can shut but, down but the what government. what are we not talking about? Election. This was the week that the Obamacare, the rollout, uh, huge problems with, with the website, with the exchanges. And it's like a third tier story. It's right, been completely overshadowed. That, certainly. No, but, but what I'm saying is that th this just gets to how the Republicans have mishandled everything. I mean, they could be scoring points over and over again uh, talking about the problems with Obamacare. We have to take a quick break. I want to come back and get a prediction from all of you on all this.